This week on the show, we have American poet and New York Times bestselling author, Cleo Wade. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of understanding why hitting rock bottom can sometimes be a blessing in disguise. The reality is change is inevitable. Though we may resist making positive changes in our lives or be too afraid to move past our comfort zone, the universe, however, has a way of making things so uncomfortable for us that we are forced to change and grow. When you think back on times you made major changes in your life, has it ever been because you had no other option? That staying in the same place was too miserable of an option and that the only other way was to start making better decisions to move into a better direction. This is why hitting rock bottom isn't always the worst thing that can happen in our lives. Sometimes we need to be so desperate for change that it serves as motivation to push ourselves into evolving and becoming the best version of ourselves. Just like a bow and arrow, sometimes you have to be pulled all the way back to launch forward into living the life you've always imagined. As Tony Robbins quotes, in life, you need either inspiration or desperation. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break, I want to talk about your fan base. You have people like Reese Witherspoon, uh, Katy Perry. What's it been like to kind of see that you're not just help, you're helping everybody with the work that you're doing and the messaging that you're putting out? I, I feel so lucky that the work connects um, to people no matter who and where they are in life. And, and I think one of the coolest things on earth is that there are poems that, um, you know, what I really try to focus on when I'm writing anything is that it feels deeply personal and also universal, which is actually really hard to do. And so it's, I think more than anything, what I'm so proud of is that there can be something that um, Reese Witherspoon posts that she loved from uh, the book or something I've written and also, you know, a hundred other, um, you know, young moms or, or um, people kind of sending their kids off to college or um, a teen, like, you know, there's something that I've seen where someone who has this really unique life, you know, I think we can all say that people in entertainment have a very unique life. So it's so cool to me that someone who has such a unique life connects to the same words as a teenager who's 17 and just trying to figure out their last year of high school before they're making the big step to college. And I think for that to me are some of my most proud moments are not just that it connects with these really incredible leaders in our world, like a Reese Witherspoon, but that and on that same exact day, it connects with a 15 or 16 year old who lives in my hometown. Wardrobe provided by Le Chateau. Next up on the show, we have American poet, artist, activist, and New York Times bestselling author, Cleo Wade. Cleo, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great, thanks. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm a big fan of your work, and I wanna talk about, I know that at the age of six, you fell in love with poetry after taking a poetry class. So what was it about poetry that ignited your passion? Well, I, went to a po I went to a summer camp that had a poetry class and it was the last period and the rumor was because I think my brother had taken it before me that if you took it last period you could kind of nap during it because now I see that the teacher was doing a meditation before but as kids in Louisiana we were calling it a nap <laughs> um, but you know poetry was the first time someone said the words to me you can put your imagination on paper in a way that didn't have to make sense. Um, my my teacher said, I want you to think of a bird of every color you've ever seen a bird in and now describe the one bird you've never seen. And this idea that we could take something that doesn't exist in the world yet and create it out of our minds was something that was so powerful to me. And, you know, I know people do that with superheroes and and, and and Marvel action figures. and But I think for someone who is a little more quiet and interior um, growing up, I, um, I thought, wow, I can create this feeling and this sense. Um, and even though I didn't know that because I was so young, I just 
I was so excited to be in a space where you couldn't do it wrong. You know, you can write yeah. it as long as the poem made you feel something or you created something, it was right. And it was really the first time someone had said that to me. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you you discovered your passion at such a young age. I think that's that's incredible. And Cleo, in 2017, you did a TED Talk that garnered over 1.5 million views called Want to Change the World? Start by Being Brave Enough to Care. So tell us about that message and what inspired it. Uh, in America specifically at that time, um, we were you know, really starting to feel such a divide and, and a lack of, of, of neighborliness and beloved community. Um, and I'd been doing um, this this kind of project of mine. It's a passion project that I do for free called the Are You OK booth, where I sit in a park for 10 hours and I just listen to people and the book in the in the booth says, Are You OK? Free, um, peaceful and loving uh, conversation. And I was hearing so much of so much uh, so much of what I was hearing was that people felt isolated or helpless or like they didn't know what to do in a changing world or how to be involved and I started writing this long form poem um, and it was you know called um, you know be brave enough to care basically if you want to change the world start by being brave enough to care and it was about doing the little things it was about you know start small start with your neighbor right next to you don't think of how you change the, you know, make sure your neighbor next to you has enough food. Don't think about trying to feed the, the world first and, and actually creating a ripple in our world and, and how impactful that can be uh, was a huge focus of the poem. Uh, and the poem then became a TED Talk. And, and, and to me, it felt like my kind of personal anthem during that period, whenever I felt like on social media, there was so much going on and what can I do or how can I help? What am I gonna do? I, I would think of, where, well, where can I start? You know, there's so much racism in the world. There's so much anti-Semitism. There's so much, uh, you know, homophobia, transphobia, all of these things that are so awful. How do, where do we begin with these big problems? Mm -hmm. And it like, start with the first conversation with your family at your kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And, and that's still been my mantra, you know, all of these years later. Um, and, and I'm so proud of that, 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 that that poem is a, is a TED talk is, is pretty. Yeah, amazing. that's incredible. I think that's a great message. Um, just by starting small, right? People want to change the world, but it's one step at a time. It starts within and really changing yourself first. And then, you know, it translates to the outside world, right? And just doing something yeah. little as asking people how their day is going or just caring about somebody. I think that's such a important message. So congratulations on that, by the way, and all your success. <laughs> Thank you. And you've really become a viral sensation. Your poems talk about love, healing, self-love. So talk talk to us a little bit about more about your poems um, and the messaging behind them. Well, it's really similar to kind of what you just said. It starts within. I um, I remember when I was releasing my first book around that time of of my TED talk. And and more and people wondered why I didn't release a more kind of a book rooted more in politics or in, in kind of how to be, um, you know, lean into the activist space at the time at that at that exact time. And Heart Talk, my first book, really focuses on our interior world. It focuses on how to love ourselves and how to care for ourselves and how to respect ourselves and and feel worthy of our dreams and feel worthy of a thought or an idea and and how to be nice to somebody especially if the somebody is you and i i do believe that for me at least in my journey um fundamentally there was a shift when i realized that i was worthy of being loved and even liked by myself and yeah. everything changed for me the types of friends I had changed the my work changed I mean it, it seems like oh I knew my passion at six I didn't I the first time I felt alive by something really cool was when I went to that poetry summer camp around six or seven but I buried that dream I didn't think I could be a poet I didn't think that I was worthy of my thoughts and dreams I grew up you know poor in Louisiana I didn't have a ton of opportunity I, I'm not at the most educated classically educated person in the world um i didn't i didn't know what i was worthy of until i had a kind of aha moment 
15 years ago, that was like, there's, you know, there's something important inside of me. I have something to say. And, and if I can nurture that with love and, and kind of even self-friendliness, just being nice, saying, looking in the mirror and not looking at every single flaw, you know, yeah. not thinking my body is something that there's something always wrong with instead of saying, you know what, I'm so grateful. You know, one of my first poems that kind of, um, you know, was shared really widely from my first book was called A Love Note to My Body. Mm. And it said, first and foremost, I want to say thank you. You got up today. This idea that we begin life or see life through gratitude first um, is so important. And, and that shift for me changed my world. It didn't just change my life. It like turned my life into a world um, that was has helped me heal so much of my childhood and my past. So when I ask people to kind of go into that journey inward to find a way to love and like themselves, it's because I personally know the benefits of that. And, and, and it really does make you able to be such a better community member too. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, you know, when you said that, it, it actually gave me goosebumps because self-love is a journey that we all are going on, right? And and I think so many times we, on a subconscious level, we think we're not worthy of things. We think, okay, we're not worthy of this. We might not even know it, but we don't feel deserving of success yeah. and love and all of these things. So I love that your poems are really helping people. How has it been to see that your poems and these words that you're writing are really healing people around the world? I think alongside my family, my partnership and my my two daughters, it's the joy of my life. I mean, I I think, you know, it's amazing to have these great articles or reviews of your work um, in the world or people, you know, really saying, wow, that's amazing, this thing you did. But none of that compares to someone writing you a letter and saying, you know, your poem got me through my divorce or your work got me through uh, the hardest time of my high school experience or your, you know, your work helped me remember that like there was a second act within me and I started a new business at 65. Um, or I see my poems on the top of a graduation cap um, or tattooed on someone's arm as a reminder to love themselves. There is nothing, there's nothing that compares to um, just knowing that you feel useful in someone's life. I mean, I think sometimes we're really busy chasing, trying to feel impressive when I think the greatest compliment is that what you make is useful. Um, yeah. It's a goal for people. Yeah, of course, that you're, of course, being of service to the world, right? Not just um, success yeah. means, you know, different things. But I also want to talk about, I feel like poetry, writing, it's such an intimate thing. I'm sure there was a level of risk when you first posted online and, you know, caring what people think. Were you nervous at all when you first posted your first poem on social media? Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, I did. There was a few things I'd kind of done before that kind of helped me work up the nerve. Yeah. Which um, I'd done some public art installations where I created, put my work on really large spaces. Um, and that kind of helped, but at the same time, you do feel like people just kind of walk on by. So, yeah. and I was one of my last friends to get on social media. And it's funny because I think because so many people find my work on social media, they think I'm like a, like a tech person. And I literally like don't know how to do anything, but take a photo of my notebook and turn it black and white. And that's pretty much everything you see on my page. And so I think for me, when I first did it, I, I really waited for a while because I knew if I was going to be in a space, I wanted it to feel intentional and I wanted it to be authentic to me. And I didn't want to kind of, I didn't want to jump into a water and have to go with the current in that water. So I didn't want to say, oh, you know, everyone I know is getting on social media and then social media is telling you to be this person or do this thing in order to be successful in this social space. Mm -hmm. I knew that if I walk came into the space I wanted to feel like myself and like an individual and like I could set my own tone and I wasn't at the mercy of like what was wrong or right or getting likes or not yeah. um, and that's why to this day and my first post is a photo from my notebook and I honestly started by sharing it with my friends and I saw how much 
you know, if my friend was going through a breakup, I remember being on vacation and one of my really close girlfriends um, was going through a breakup. And I remember writing on a sheet of paper, you know, you are the strongest flower. Remember that when the wet weather changes. And I took a photo of it and I sent it to her and it was what got her through that period of time. And I know that, that it did. Yeah. And I thought, I remember thinking to myself, I know this could help somebody else. Um, I know that I could share this and what would happen if you treated every single one of your readers like they were your best friend going through their hardest time. And that was and is and will always be how and why I write what I write. Mm -hmm. I think that's really inspirational for anyone watching that, you know, if you have a passion, even though you might be scared to share your gifts with the world, of course, with social media, you know, we're always worried about what people will think, but do it anyways, you know, post it anyways, because you never know how it's going to help someone, right? Someone just might and read something. E and even if it's just one person, um, exactly. and start with your friends. I, I'm so grateful to my girlfriends and my best friends. I mean, even with this book being my fourth book, um, you know, in my acknowledgement page, right, you know, right after my family or my girlfriends, I couldn't write or do or have or have be able to cultivate the bravery to write and put my work into the world any day of the week if I didn't have my my close girlfriends. I, I just couldn't. They're my muses. They're um, everything to me. I love that. And speaking about books, let's talk about your book, Remember Love, that's launching October 17th, 2023. Yeah. Let's talk about the book, the messaging, and how we can help someone, as you referenced, through tender times. You know, it, it's kind of like I was saying about my girlfriends. I mean, what the things that I write in my book are the uh, uh, most of them are rooted in or inspired by conversations I'm having with my friends. When my friends are going through a tough time, or I'm going through a tough time, I write about. I have a sec the one of the sections that I'm the most excited about in this book to share is part three of this book is called Notes on Heartbreak. And Notes on Heartbreak are kind of all the things that I've I think that's a question I get asked the most. I'm going through a part I'm going through a breakup. I I'm having I'm struggling to get through it. How do I this? How do I that? And you know, I am not a guru and I don't claim to be. Um and I think it's also important to say you know, we can't hack heartbreak. There's no shortcuts to heartbreak. If you've ever truly had your heart broken wide open and all of your hopes for a relationship were dashed, you know that the only thing that helps is to have somebody sitting there and holding your hand through it. Um, there's not a trick. There's not a hack. You can't, there, there just isn't. You have to feel what you feel until it doesn't feel that way anymore. And I really wanted to write a book that had a section that was gonna hold someone's hand through that tough and tender time. And this book is for that person and it's for the person who might feel lost after, you know, this kind of era we were living in where I feel like, you know, we were inside for years and then we came out and our goals are all over the place or we feel alone. Um, but I think what I'm the most excited about is the notes on heartbreak because I feel like especially now there's been so many kind of breakups. I don't know about you, but I even saw like a random tabloid cover in the yeah. airport. Like it's breakup season. It's breakup year, another breakup. So yeah, <laughs> I think we can all relate to going through a bad breakup, having our girlfriends kind of just get us through it. And yeah, as you said, there is no simple no, trick. <laughs> there's not a, like, there's not a, you know, I think we live in this culture of like, here's how you did it. Da, 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 and it's like, you know what, when you are going through grief and you have lost someone you love, when you are, when your heart is broken because you did not want to sign that divorce paper, um, when you are having postpartum depression, which I also write about my experience in that in the book, um, when you are feeling lost and like you don't know yourself, there are just, you know, you really just, you need gentle guidance, gentle words, and you just need a hand to hold. And and as I wrote this book, I just thought like, I thought, what was everything I said as I held my friend's hands through this? And when I needed, when I could only hold myself, what were the thoughts that helped me feel like this wasn't the worst day of my life? Mm -hmm. I like that your your work is rooted in love. That's the messaging behind it, because I think we live in such a world that's all about success and moving fast and just get over it. But I think it's important to have someone like you writing about love and healing and and 
your journey of self-love. And I want to talk about your journey of self-love because it might inspire someone watching this that maybe is struggling with that, struggling to feel deserving. What was your journey on self-love? What are some things that you did to really feel worthy? Therapy. Yeah. For one. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, and I am a person who has read every self-help book in the land. Um, and I love them. And, and I also felt that as I read them, I didn't feel like they were the most accessible reads. I think that especially in today's world, if you're whether you're a busy parent or you're doing a million things, or you just have like what I call Twitter or Instagram brain, where you just cannot focus yeah. <laughs> offline. Um, it's, I think it's really hard to sit through the entire kind of either chapter or book on self-care or I, I think it's that feels like the thing you keep putting off that you don't have time for yeah. and so I also wanted to make sure that every time I wrote or created something it was something my busiest self could make a moment for mm -hmm. and that's why I write the types of books I write and I think for me I've kind of collected all of the things I've learned from every self-help book I've learned, all the things I've learned from my own therapy, all the things I've learned from challenging myself in my friendships and relationships to like have them be these really high integrity, um, tough conversation um, and that's okay, incredibly compassionate and empathetic spaces. I think I, for me, the shift of I, kind of had this awakening when I read all those books and then I was in therapy myself, I was like, you know what? There's there's ways to share this information um, that someone that don't have to feel laborious and they don't have to feel like you had to take all the time I took to do it. And so to me, I try to think of myself as like, I just kind of, um, it's almost like a mom writing a note to, to like, a, or grandma writing a note to the grandkids in the, in the lunchbox. Yeah. I try to kind of, do that with anything I've learned, whether it was from a book that day or, or in my own life kind of conversations. I love that. I think that's that's such great messaging, just to be kind to yourself. And I want to talk about your fan base. You have people like Reese Witherspoon, uh, Katy Perry. What's it been like to kind of see that you're not just help, you're helping everybody with the work that you're doing and the messaging that you're putting out? I, I feel so lucky that the work connects um, to people no matter who and where they are in life. And and I think one of the coolest things on earth is that there are poems that, um, you know, what I really try to focus on when I'm writing anything is that it feels deeply personal and also universal, which is actually really hard to do. And so it's, I think more than anything, what I'm so proud of is that there can be something that um, Reese Witherspoon posts that she loved from, uh, the book or something I've written and also, you know, a hundred other, um, you know, young moms or, or, um, people kind of sending their kids off to college or, um, a teen, like, you know, there's something that I've seen where someone who has this really unique life, you know, I think we can all say that people in entertainment have a very unique life. So, it's so cool to me that someone who has such a unique life connects to the same words as a teenager who's 17 and just trying to figure out their last year of high school before they're making the big step to college. And I think for that to me are some of my most proud moments are not just that it connects with these really incredible leaders in our world, like Arise Witherspoon, but that I'm on that same exact day it connects with a 15 or 16 year old who lives in my hometown. Yeah. That is like, I think the moment of um, such pride I have. And, and, and I'm, I'm so grateful for, for that because it connects them too. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's so important is to know that we're connected. Absolutely. I think love is such a universal language and the poetry that you're you're writing, the books that you're writing, as you said, is helping everybody. It can help someone in high school. It can help someone, a mother, maybe, you know, that's struggling. It, it can help everybody. So I love that your books are so universal. So yeah, congratulations on that. And I want to talk about, you know, I created my platform to inspire, to uplift and to be a beacon of light for anyone watching. So I want to ask you for anyone that's going through a hard time, 
maybe not feeling worthy, deserving, maybe they're not seeing their dreams manifest and they're putting in the hard work, what would you say to uplift and inspire them? Try to make the work not feel hard. You can be gentle with yourself as you change. Uh, all change does not have to feel like a cannonball. You can go to the shallow end of the pool. You can take the stairs. You can gently wade in. I think so much of why we don't make changes or why we struggle during times of change or transition is because we feel that they have to be very harsh. And um, a lot of us just really wrestle with feeling able to love ourselves while we're in a really harsh situation. And, and that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. And so I'd say, be kind and gentle to yourself as you're making the change and and think about how to change or shift or um work on something within yourself in a way that is so kind and so gentle and it can be slow and it can be in your own way and it doesn't have to be i saw my friend do it this way and this really helped her so i'm gonna do it that way we're all different it looks different for everyone. It is different for everyone. And honor that. Honor your unique sensitivities. Honor your kind of unique aversions. Ask, be curious about why you have those. Be, be kind, be, I think the most important thing you can do is be gentle and curious about yourself. Yeah. And in that, you have so much information and those changes will actually start to flow. If you don't feel flow, I, I usually feel that the approach is not right for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's great advice. It's funny because my producer was just telling me before we started, you're your worst critic. You're always so hard on yourself because I'm a perfectionist. I always want things to be perfect. But I think yeah. taking that approach of just, you know, just, just letting things flow, not trying to control everything, right? I think another part of uh, um, not being happy sometimes has to do with control, trying to control everything around you, but it really starts within. So I think that's... Uh, yeah. that's and, and sometimes as a recovering perfectionist myself, <laughs> um, a lot of that is this kind of struggle of not enoughness, like to say mm -hmm. to yourself, you know what, this was enough today. Like I got here and I did it and I have to let these 10 details go because trying to hold on to them is probably less relevant than I think. Mm -hmm. And like, this is enough. And I think for me, this I, I remember writing and I, and I might butcher my own words in this, but I wrote in Remember Love, um, you know, enoughness is not a mountain to climb. It's a mirage of a mountain. You yeah. don't need to, you need to see through it. And I think for me, this idea of saying like, am I building my own mountain that I always have to climb and it's sweaty and it's hard because at the top of it, I get to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Or is that mountain even there? Can I actually just walk through it? And that's been very helpful for me. That's very powerful. Cleo, you're giving me goosebumps. Oh <laughs> this is like all goosebumps. It's like I'm having all these epiphanies talking to you. <laughs> and Cleo, what else are you currently working on? Well, I'm really just focusing on bringing Remember Love into the world. Um, it's, you know, you spend all this time kind of writing and kind of cooking this book baby. And then you kind of have to mentally prepare for sharing it with people and so i'm preparing for my tour which i'm so excited for i'm touring um throughout america starting on october 17th in brooklyn and or i guess the 13th in la um but touring is my favorite thing to do because i get to be with all of my readers and i love them so much and i stay at every tour stop and i meet every single person and so it's a real kind of thrill for me and so I'm basically just, I feel like I'm in that athletic mode of like, okay, we're going to go put this into the world and we're going to, I'm packing up my kids and we're going on tour. Exciting. Well, Cleo, thank you so much for being on the show today. Continue the amazing work that you're doing because it's really helping people. And, you know, you're really using your gift to be of service to the world, which I think is really inspiring. So thank you for that. And, oh and I'm looking forward to your book. That's going to be exciting. Gosh, me too. I'm um, so, I, I haven't gotten the first copy to hold in my hands yet, but besides like the, the original original, but I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. We're excited <sighs> for it. We're going to link that information for our viewers to receive it October 17th, right? So that's the launch. Yes, October 17th. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Have an amazing day. Thank you. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook. Mm -hmm.